Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Tillotson Grant Seeker Information Session. I hope you can um, hear me. My name is Jean Clark. I'm uh, the Tillotson Fund Advisor for the Neil and Louise Tillotson Fund. And um, this morning, we're going to be um, talking about the Tillotson Fund and um, going through some of our program grant programs as well as our new strategic plan. I'm just um, if you want to notice in the chat, we've asked if you want to list your name, your organization, and a fun winter activity that you enjoy doing. Um, we'd love to know who's on the call today. And we're going to wait maybe another minute or two, and then we're going to get started. There's also some instructions if you would like to access the French translation, and that those directions are in the chat. Um, so we're happy to um, welcome our, our translator, Danielle Allard, who's um, translating from English into French and French into English, so. So I think most people are on the call now. So again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is the Neil and Louise Tillotson Fund Grant Seeker Information Session. My name is Jean Clark, and I'm the Tillotson Funds Manager for the Neil and Louise Tillotson Fund. We have about 50 people on the call today from Quebec, Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire. And um, again, as you join the call, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat and just um, list your name, your organization, and maybe a fun winter activity, I'm going to call on the Tillotson Fund staff to introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Um, so, Sonia, do you want to start us off? Sure. Well, hello and welcome, everybody. It is so nice to see your faces, even though they're in the Zoom box. They're all lovely. Um, my name is Sonia Solanti, and I am the director of the Neil and Louise Tillotson Funds. I've been in the role for about two and a half years now, and I'm uh, calling in from my home in Bethlehem, New Hampshire. Over to you, Phoebe. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you all. I'm Phoebe Backler. I am a program officer with the Tillotson Funds, and I'm calling in from my home office in Gorham, New Hampshire. And I'll throw in a favorite winter activity as I'm really actually looking forward to cross-country skiing. Um, so I can't believe after being 75 degrees a couple of days ago that we're it's not far from that season. So great to see you. And John, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is John Nicolodi, and I'm a consultant that facilitates the Empower Cause Youth Grants Program. And my favorite winter activity, I'm going to go with ice climbing, though cross-country skiing is coming up as a close second these days. Um, great to see you all. And I'll pass it back to Eugene. All right. Thanks, John. I'm um, just going to go over briefly a few housekeeping details. Um, please mute yourself unless you have a question. If you need technical assistance, um, please type in the chat, which is located at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be monitoring that for your comments and questions as we go along. We're going to pause during the presentation as well as at the very end so you can ask any questions that might come up for you. As I mentioned, the session is available in English and French, and if you'd like to access the French translation, there's a symbol that looks like a globe at the bottom of your screen. And you should just um, click on that and you'll get an option that says French or English. And you can click on that and you should be able to toggle between the French and the English. If you only wanna hear French, you can choose, um, there's like an option for that says mute original audio. So choose that if you would like only to hear the French um, translation. You're also free to type your questions in French or in English and Danielle will translate that for us. So I just wanna, pause here for a minute just to say um, if if anybody's having trouble with the translation we should probably try to address that right now so I don't hear any questions or concerns about the translation so I think we're good to go um, just so you know the session is being recorded and um, the PowerPoint and the recording will be available on the Charitable Foundation's website after the session. It's actually not possible to uh, record the session in French, 
um, but we will have the PowerPoint available in, in French and in English. So I think from there, what I'm going to share my um, screen so we can go to the PowerPoint presentation. All right, I hope everybody can see the um, first slide that, that's up. And I'm gonna be going, oops, hold on a minute. I just have to let some more people into the room. And um, just to go over our, our agenda for this morning, today's presentation takes about 30 to 40 minutes. We're going to review the Neil and Louise Tillotson Fund's history, geography, and our new strategic plan. We're also going to be reviewing the grant programs and the application process for the large grants, local grants, dash grants, and Empower COAS youth. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go along or type in the chat. And um, at the end of the session, we'll also pause and ask any, you can ask any questions at that point in time. And I'm just going to turn things over to Sonia, who's going to talk about the community investment framework. Hey, everybody. Um, I want people to tell me if I am speaking too fast, especially for our translators. So if I start to ramble on in a quick manner, just uh, pop a note in the chat or just interrupt me and say, slow down, Nellie, and I will do so. Um, and so, yeah, I'm gonna kick things off with a little bit of background about the Neil and Louise Tillotson Fund um, and particularly about Neil and Louise. Um, so Neil Tilton was an entrepreneur and he was born right in the North Country in Coaticook, actually. And his um, grandmother, as he says, who helped get him born, uh, carried him over the border where he, uh, so he was able to get American um, citizenship. And from, you know, his very humble beginnings in the North Country, um, he went on to build numerous co uh, companies and actually employed thousands of people in the region and internationally. His wife, Louise, was a force all of her own. She came from England and worked for the BBC for a while. She also started a number of her own companies, um, even built her own house at one point. And when Neil Tillotson passed away at the age of 102, he left um, the bulk of his assets to charitable purposes. And from there, um, Louise Tillotson worked with um, the uh, original trustees of the fund to establish the Neil and Louise Tillotson Fund at the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. And that was established in um, 2006. And since that time, since 2006, the fund has done its very best uh, to be guided by the philosophies of Neil and Louise Tillotson. And those were for Mr. Tillotson to be humble, be creative, and be kind. And for Mrs. Tillotson, it was to protect the land and help the people. The fund is currently guided by a um, advisory committee of 11 people who um, live in the North Country or were original associates of Neil and Louise Tillotson. And it's staffed by three people, myself, Jean, and Phoebe, all of whom are on this call. Um, and Something we are very excited about is we just completed our third five-year strategic plan. Um, it was approved in June of 2022. Um, Phoebe's actually gonna put it right in the chat so you can download that right now um, and take a look at your leisure. Um, and the plan was developed through um, really deep community engagement, which were why we feel so confident in the plan that it really reflects community needs and interests. We also performed, um, we did some initial land, uh, research and a landscape scan of, of things that are happening in the region. We evaluated um, our current and past initiatives to understand the impact of those initiatives. And then most importantly, as I mentioned, we developed the plan in deep partnership with community members. Um, this included doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with many of our close partners. We held focus groups with um, participants in our leadership programs and other um, initiatives that the fund supports. 
And we also had two working groups that helped us both develop um, a really nice uh, encapsulation of the Neil and Louise Tillotson Fund vision, purpose, and principles. That's also available in the strategic plan for you to look at. Um, and then to develop the actual initiatives and um, community investment framework and activities of the fund. Um, and so our working group was instrumental in helping us to refine those. Then the, um, the plan would go to the advisors who would also give their input and feedback. And then we'd take it back to the um, working groups. And it just ended up being a really nice iterative process that has communities um, stamp and footprint um, in it. And so we're really excited about it. Um, it really reflects our aspirations to move towards even, um, even deeper community-led philanthropy um, and, and, our, and the purpose, and really to, to deliver on the purpose, which is stated on the slide there, um, to serve as a resource for the people of our region to forge their own pathways to well-being and cultivate a region that thrives. Again, you have the plan now. Please feel free to take a look. We're happy to schedule you know, a follow-up call if you want more information of the plan and um, would like to discuss it more. And then next slide, please, Jean. So one of the things we heard in that engagement piece um, and also through a, an assessment of our grant making practices is that folks would really appreciate it if we could add some clarity to our ge geography. Um, what is the Tilton Fund region? Uh, and so this is our, our new language and um, testing this out with you, hoping that it will, oops, somebody is sharing their screen who, who maybe accidentally didn't mean to do that. Um, so yeah, our hope is to be able to provide more clarity around what the geography is. Let's see if we can get that text back up there. There we go. All right, sorry for that. So the core area for the Tilton Fund geography is, if you think of Coas County as being the center, so Coas County is the core area, as well as communities that are directly adjacent to Coas County, so right on the borders of the county in um, Vermont, Maine, Upper Grafton County, and um, Coaticook over um, with our Canadian neighbors. And so that is the, the Tillotson Fund geography. Um, and then we also recognize that, you know, boundaries are pretty porous and there are people and services and animals and all kinds of th things flow across boundaries. And so we also consider um, programs or projects that operate outside the region, but they offer clear benefit to folks that are in the region. Um, and then within that, that also definitely includes the MRC de Cook, and we're so happy to see so many of our partners in Quaticook on the call today. Um, I do want to say if, if you are not clear, if, you, if your project or your program or your organization fits within the geography, please just reach out to us. We are happy to think through it with you. Um, you'll hear that many times today that we really um, are serious about being available to all of you to help troubleshoot or you know um, think about your ideas for funding. So please don't hesitate to contact any one of us if you have any questions. All right, next slide, please, Jean. So one of the things that you will see in our new strategic plan is the community investment framework, and this framework was designed to sort of um, identify all of the core investment areas of the fund, as well as the type of um, services that the Tillotson Fund offers to community members. So a core component of, the, of this community investment framework is our commitment um, to support community identified and community driven strategies and solutions. Again, centering around what is community need and how can we follow the lead of community and then also to apply a number of different tools um, to support community to achieve aspirations. And so definitely we provide grant making. Um, we also have access to social impact investing through a social impact fund that is actually established at the Charitable Foundation. 
we work with partners to support them to advocate as well as when it makes sense for the, the fund to advocate on behalf of partners. We're happy to support convenings um, and collaborations. And we also are really um, working on continuing to build deep partnership and work in a real partnership manner versus a kind of transactional relationship. And that's really near and dear to our hearts. So with our new community investment framework, we have outlined our four investment areas. Um, and we see these areas as actually being mutually reinforcing, um, that you can be performing an activity that falls into one of these buckets, but it actually, you know, sort of influences activities in other buckets. Um, and then uh, we also have a strong commitment to uh, making sure our investments are guided by um, equity and as always informed by community. So these new four buckets, which are not terribly different from uh, what we have supported in the past, but they're just organized in, in hopefully what is a little bit more logical way. So the first area is um, individual and family well-being. The second area is a healthy workforce ecosystem. The third area is environmental stewardship. And the fourth area is resilient communities. And I'm gonna go into more detail about what we mean by each of those on the next slide. Can you advance? Thank you. And I know this looks pretty small on your screen probably. So, um, you know, I encourage you to, if you need to open up that um, strategic plan and you can open up a PDF of this particular slide, it's in, the, in our strategic plan. So that first category of individual and family well-being, I would say in the, in the evolution of our strategy, this, this used to be kind of the basic needs category, but we actually recognize and, and hope that, that um, the fund and people in community um, supports individuals and families to not only have their basic needs met, but you know, everything they need to really thrive. And so it's moving beyond just, you know, meeting basic needs to, to a spectrum of like, what do you need to really thrive and, and be, be happy and healthy in your life? So we will continue to support um, organizations and activities that meet um, basic needs for families. This is things like food, accommodation, transportation, healthcare, um, education, learning, um, childcare. And then we'll also look at um, strengthening the systems of care that surround individuals and families. Um, so this is the broad array, array of supports that um, support people to thrive. And in those systems of care, we look for things that focus on um, collaboration among agencies, um, placing families and individuals at the center of their own sort of action plans and, and that are strength-based, um, cultural competence, um, working with different types of people from all different backgrounds and, and walks of life, uh, ensuring that services are collaborative and community-based, um, and that um, agencies are working together um, and have shared responsibility for successful results. Within our individual and family well-being investment area, there's um, a special initiative that we have been working on for several years um, that we're advancing. We're calling these big bets, um, which is uh, initiatives that the fund um, supports in a, in a more proactive manner. So in the past, we have had um, a long-term partnership with um, agencies that are working to advance um, early childhood care and development in the region. And as those partners continue to develop their own strategies and plans, they have advanced um, to a whole family approach. And so instead of focusing on only on children ages zero to eight, um, they're expanding their strategy to look at the whole family ecosystem and how strengthening that can actually improve outcomes for, for kiddos. And so the Neil and Louise Tilton Fund will continue to support that initiative and will follow the lead of our partners and uh, invest and partner with those organizations to advance their whole family strategy. I'm just going to pause for a minute because I know I'm talking a lot. I hope I'm talking slowly, but are there any questions at this point? You could put them in the chat or you can just shout it out. Someone says, I don't see a link to the plan. It, it, it's it's um, actually uploaded to the, the chat. You should be able to click on the little blue button next to the plan and download it. 
Any other questions? I'll just continue. Oh, can you elaborate on your definition of learning? And this is from uh, Um, Yes, yeah, so I think that that would refer to anything that is focused on um, youth uh, and youth programs that um, increase students at, um, opportunities to learn about topics that they're interested in, um, auxiliary programs to normal education, like K-12 education, professional development programs. Um, one thing that is a little bit tricky, and I'll just be clear about this right now, is that the Tilton Fund um, typically does not fund um, activities that are should be part of a, a public K-12 education budget. However, we do, do fund um, support programs that are complementary to a K-12 education, and I hope if that's clear. We also support community college initiatives, um, professional development activities, um, uh, substance use disorder prevention programs, um, you know, computer classes for seniors, those, all, all those sorts of things that help, help people advance their, their own knowledge and learning and ability to like operate and really, you know, function well in, in, in our culture. Do you support on equal parts the, these different types of categories? Um, I think this, I, if I'm understanding the question, I think the question is around, do we provide equal funding for each of these four buckets? I'm not, I hope that's the, I'm interpreting that correctly. If not, let me know. Um, essentially, we're responsive to the grants that come in the door. So we haven't allocated a, a particular amount of funding to each one of these buckets and we'll be responsive to um, applications as they come in. However, we have made a commitment to track and um, analyze the type of funding that's coming in so that if, you know, one, you know, one grant round, there's, man, there's just a huge amount of applications that are focused on basic needs, but not very many on the workforce ecosystem. We'll be curious about that and, um, you know, start to wonder why and, and maybe do some, um, some research to understand why that's happening. Right. Okay, so I'll move on to the healthy workforce ecosystem. This area developed out of our previous efforts to focus on economic development across the region, which is a pretty big um, sector and, and pretty big area to try to influence. And so in light of uh, many of the changes that are, you know, in happening right now, post, well, I guess we're still kind of in a pandemic, but post pandemic ish, um, we decided to focus in on um, the workforce ecosystem, specifically, you know, what do employers and employees need to be able to thrive? And so under this category, we are looking at projects and activities and organizations that, um, that help folks to attract and retain the workforce, um, to establish workforce housing solutions, to help companies and employees build skills and systems for sustained success. Uh, ways to link employers and employees to financial supports. And um, another huge piece is um, increasing access to affordable quality childcare. And within this bucket, our, our big bet or our initiative that we're gonna be leading is to establish a workforce housing seed fund that's for um, planning and concept development, um, pre-development cost essentially for housing solutions. And then that would be linked to a workforce housing investment fund that would provide uh, larger amounts of funding for development and construction of, of projects, uh, promising projects. That is in its very early stages of development. We don't have anything formally set up yet, but if, you, uh, if you're brewing on an idea that's related to that, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And we anticipate this um, initiative will launch sometime in the summer, spring, summer of 2023. Right. Okay, moving right along to the environmental stewardship uh, bucket. So we recognize that, you know, the, the natural resources of the region is part of what makes us so unique. And it's also a huge, you know, um, 
sustaining those natural resources is a, is a huge part of our economy. And so we will continue to focus on environmental stewardship. Um, another piece of the environmental stewardship category is that during our um, community engagement processes in developing the plan, a number of, of, our, um, of our partners indicated that paying attention to climate change and um, funding programs and activities that uh, mitigate the impacts of climate change is really critical and important. And so we've really elevated this environmental stewardship piece in our current um, investment framework. And so under this category, we look at projects that support folks to be good stewards of the land, air, the forests, um, our waterways and wildlife. Um, we wanna continue to encourage and support responsible tourism and recreation. Uh, looking at um, sustainable food systems. Um, again, there's crossover there with individual and family well-being um, food security piece. Uh, we will continue to support and, um, and advance um, green energy, energy efficiency, um, and green building activities, and then uh, projects that focus on climate smart forestry solutions. And our, we don't really have like an initiative that we're leading in this category other than to um, transition. We had a previous strategy that was focused on um, economic development in the human powered rec and energy efficiency um, sectors. And we're just um, expanding that to, to recognize that natural resources is just an important driver across our economy. And so um, continuing to support um, the natural capital recognizing that it's crucial for a thriving economy and healthy communities. And by the way, I do want to say, you know, we have listed out some bullet points of, of the types of programs and projects that we, you know, we're interested in. This, this isn't an all exhaustive list. So if there are, there are things that you are considering but aren't necessarily on this list, you know, please reach out and have a conversation with us because it doesn't preclude other types of activities. The list would just get really long if we tried to show everything. So. And then finally, the last category is resilient communities. And um, this category came out of um, looking at the work that the fund has done over a number of years around leadership development and you know, fostering um, community building hubs and uh, you know, gathering places and building networks among individuals and, and um, organizations in the region. And so we want to continue to advance and support resilience in our in our local communities, but we're actually moving away from the language that's focused on leadership development and thinking about how do we advance community building. And part of the reason for that is there are a lot of people who are doing amazing things in their communities, but they may not necessarily identify as a leader or call themselves a leader. And we recognize that there is room for everybody at the party and at the table. So. Um, we're moving more in the spirit of community building. And within that category, we're, we're really excited about programs that focus on youth empowerment and youth engagement, um, opportunities for folks to convene or collaborate, to celebrate, to come together, to network, um, opportunities uh, for trainings or other programs that help uh, community builders build their skills, knowledge, and approaches to advancing equity. Um, again, focusing on like revitalizing those population hubs and preserving the assets of the region that make it unique, both cultural and historical assets. Civic health is an, another big piece of, um, you know, uh, re-enlivening um, civil uh, public discourse and building connections across, you know, whatever political spectrum you're on. And then strengthening municipal capacity and leadership is another area that we're interested in supporting. And our big bet under this category is something we're super excited about. Um, in early on in our community engagement, we also heard from um, folks in the region that you know a real desire for the Tilton Fund staff to be more present in community. And there are three of us, um, and it's a big region, and so we're trying to figure out how to do that. And then through feedback from community, we. Um, we came up with this plan to actually hire three um, full-time, what we're calling community stewards who live in the region. Um, and their, their role is really to serve as community champions and um, community organizers and advocates 
Um, and then uh, they'll be focusing on supporting those community builders to advance their own priorities. And the three regions that uh, those folks will be based in are uh, the Berlin-Gorham area, uh, Lancaster-Whitefield area, and colbrook Canaan area. And there'll be soon lots of information available at that, about that, about those roles will be, um, we're in the process of refining the job description and it will be posted soon. And um, you know, hoping to get those folks on board um, in Q1 of 2023. And then the other piece that is complementary to that is to create um, the Community Builders Hub. And the hub is an entity that will provide a, um, a platform for both offering um, community, a cohort of community builders, so a formal training program, program for folks who want to go deeper into community building. And then informal opportunities for um, training and skill development around community building. Um, and then this community building hub will also be the home of the community stewards, um, which keeps us keeps them connected to the Neil and Louise Tilton Fund, but also hopefully offers enough autonomy to be able to um, really focus 100% of their time on community building. All right. I have done my spiel. Um, there's a can this can the same organization apply for different projects? Um, yes, you can apply across the spectrum of these um, community investment areas. But and Jean will go into this in more detail. We do encourage um, people to only apply for one one type of grant per year, unless it's a dash grant. So if you were thinking to apply for um, a large and a local grant, you'd actually be better positioned to just pick one um, for, for that calendar year. Um, but you can, you know, we would love to see applications for things that are like this, you know, this um, proposal kind of hits each one of these areas or, you know, it's focused on two of these investment areas. I hope that answered your question. That's it for me. I think we're on to, uh, I think Phoebe is next. Great. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, so you all presumably are here with us today to hear about this uh, community investment framework that Sonia just uh, sort of laid out for you and, and the areas that we are funding in. Uh, but then we want to uh, now take you into some of the changes that we're making to our grant making in 2023. And Jean is going to get into sort of the mechanics of the specific and different grant programs that are available to you. Um, but I'll say uh, before we dive into some of the changes that we're making to our grant making that this um, these changes are informed by, as Sonia said, in our strategic planning process, we had a whole range of conversations and one on one interviews, focus groups, we had these two working groups. And through those conversations, one of the topics that we were able to uh, dig into with community partners was how um, how might we make these, these grant dollars accessible in a way that allows grant seekers to spend less time on the applying um, and reporting for, uh, for um, accessing these resources and more time uh, carrying out the mission of your organization. So that feedback and um, information from those conversations was uh, brought into a process of re, sort of reimagining and rethinking these grant making programs. Um, the other aspect that, uh, you know, uh, other um, information that was brought in to inform these changes really came from conversations and research uh, looking into what other funders that are shifting their, their approach to build deeper more trusting partnerships and relationships with organizations that are that they're funding um, and so some of that best practice in, in trust-based philanthropy was brought into some of these changes as well so Jean if you want to advance so what this actually means moving forward um, so you will see um, when we when you actually are looking at the application itself uh, that we have 
we have taken, we've really spent time thinking about what is the information that we most need in a written form from our grant seekers and used that process to distill our questions from 10 down to four questions in both our local and large grants applications. Um, you will also see that you can upload your budget um, in any format. It can be um, a Word document, it can be an Excel spreadsheet, but you no longer need to use the, the template of the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation um, for your application. Um, we also are moving to trying to expand the ways in which we are accepting uh, reports. So for some people, they really, uh, they appreciate the opportunity to, to capture their thoughts in the written form. Um, it's just sort of helps to process and think through what did we learn? What did we accomplish with these resources? But for others, uh, conversation is preferable. So we are offering that as a, um, a the opportunity at, at both the interim reporting stage, if you're if you've applied for a multi year grant and for the final report to just be a, a conversation with a staff person. Um, the staff person our, the staff member will write up notes from the report uh, from the conversation share those back with you to check for understanding, but then ultimately just upload those notes into our online grant. Uh, platform so that it will serve as as the report. The one additional option is for some projects or programs, a video is actually the best way to capture the story of the work that's been done. And so we will have a, a way for you to upload a video sort of describing and depicting the work that you've done. In terms of our large grants program, and again, Jean is going to get into more of the specifics of these different programs in a, in a bit, we have opted to move to a rolling deadline. So what that means is any time over the course of the year, you can apply um, to, you can submit an application. Um, the, the grant committees will make decisions in March and, in, um, and then again in September. Um, and what this was, the reason we moved to this is we were finding from organizations that in some cases they were accelerating uh, the pace of their work and submitting applications before the, the project or the, the work was really ready. Um, or they were delaying the process of, of carrying out their work really dependent on um, our grant deadline rather than what was what was best needed for the work itself. So we've moved to this rolling deadline and we've moved to a single stage ap invited application. And Jean again is gonna share more about what that means, but, but essentially in the past, uh, applicants to the large grants program have have submitted sort of a concept paper and then have if they've been invited um, then submit a full application during um, in the last couple of years we've experimented with just asking for a single um, a single application and that's actually been beneficial to everybody involved uh, for both staff and our due diligence for the grant seekers and for our grant making committees. Um, so just trying to streamline the, again, less work um, for you all so that you can spend more time and attention on carrying out your mission. Um, in terms of this improved accessibility piece, um, we have as today is a good example in our um, in in our grant uh, grantee information sessions. We are offering those sessions uh, in French. Our materials will be available in French. Um, we have ensured that our website and the grant portal is ADA compliant, and that it also works uh, with mobile devices. Um, one actually one important piece of the translation um, uh, changes that we have made that I wanted to note in the past in our conversations with staff and grantees of French speaking grantees, we haven't always had a translator available for those conversations with grantees. We will be doing that moving forward. And I'll just say from personal experience, I know that there is really important information that is um, 
that is lost in uh, in those conversations or that I don't fully absorb because of uh, a language gap. Um, I think I saw a question about uh, what is ADA compliant. Um, it is referencing the America with Disabilities Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and it really gets to. Um, and Sonia, you may want to help me with this, but it gets to um, ensuring that there are reduced barriers in terms of accessing information for for people with disabilities. Do you want to add? Yeah, to that? I can just add that. Yeah, there's there are formal um, uh, policies and procedures that define what what does compliance look like. Everything from the color scheme that you use on a website to making sure that any images that come up are have a caption so that people um, you know of all ranges of abilities are able to see your access materials and consume them. Um, and so there are there's tools that we can we use to make sure that um, our materials are compliant. Great, thank you. The last piece on this slide that we wanted to just share with you, um, the a, a, a common theme in our conversation with community partners through our strategic planning process was um, noting a desire to come back together. Partly that was due to being separated through uh, the the worst months of COVID, um, but partly it was referencing, some of you may remember in earlier years of the Neil and Louise Tillotson Fund, we used to have something called the COA Symposium, which was an annual or every other year convening of cross-sector stakeholders who came together um, just to sort of cross-pollinate, share the work that they're, they're um, undertaking in community, what they're observing, and have a little fun together. And um, we have we moved more recently towards kind of sector specific convenings. So um, in 2023 and moving forward um, through the course of the strategic plan, our intention is to have an annual convening where we're bringing together uh, grant recipients um, and other community partners who, again, have an opportunity to share what they're working on, what they're learning, what they're testing, uh, things that didn't go as expected, um, and also, um, you know, sort of bring in some interesting stories from, from other places across uh, the country in terms of, you know, interesting models of rural development. So stay tuned for that, more to come on that front. Um, Jean, if you wanna go ahead with the next slide, great. So people often ask us, you know, what, what makes for a competitive application to the Neil and Louise Tillotson Fund? And I think um, if we have these sort of these three core areas that we look for, our grant making committees look for, and I think the best way to think about it is as the amount that you're seeking uh, in terms of grant dollars increases, the bar or the um, evidence of these three things uh, gets higher uh, or, or the, the need to see evidence of these things gets more important. Um, so meaningful collaboration, what we're talking about in, in that is the extent to which your organization is partnering with and at the very least aware of other organizations that have a similar mission or a similar uh, purpose. Um, are you looking to collaborate across sector? Are you working as part of a community and you're, you're sort of thinking more regionally about how your community can partner effectively with other communities in your, near, nearby? Um, and so elevating to the extent that you are doing those things and collaborating effectively, elevate those stories in your application so that our grant making committees know about it and hear about it. The next aspect is measurable impact being, you know, how are you thinking about evaluating your work? How will you know what kind of impact you've had? And so again, in your application, you can really elevate um, the ways that you're thinking about um, capturing that learning um, so that you give the grant making committees a sense of how you're thinking about your impact and learning. The final piece is leveraging resources, which really gets at um, what is the, the bigger picture in terms of other funders that are committing resources to, to your work? Are there businesses that are contributing um, services at a reduced cost even, you know, really 
capturing the, the cash in, but also in-kind contributions. If you have a lot of volunteers that are supporting the work, please be sure in your budget upload that you, uh, you describe, you can include a narrative as part of that upload to give us a sense of all the different forms of contribution of resources and time and talent that are going to support this work. Again, it just helps our grant making committees have a better sense of um, the breadth of support that you have been able to assemble to, to move your work forward. Um, and then, Jean, if you want to advance to the next one. So we have capital criteria. This is it for those who have applied in the past or attended these workshops in the past. This is consistent with what we've requested um, for capital projects. So if you are, say, purchasing a piece of equipment or you are working on a rehab to the building that your facility is based in, um, there are a few things that we do look for in these applications. Um, so again, make sure that you're, you're talking about uh, these things um, in your application if you're applying for capital expenses. First being that you have a building plan. So you have thought, show us that you've thought through the whole scope of this project, um, that you have thought about not only what it will cost in order to um, uh, to undertake the full project, but then also what, what are the ongoing maintenance costs that are associated with this work. Another criteria that we have for capital um, expenses gets at uh, you know, showing the diversity of your funding mix. So this gets back to what we were, what I was talking about earlier about leveraging other resources. So if you're able to show that that you have um, a range of other funding sources that are that have already been contributed to supporting the purchase of this capital um, of, of this capital expense, it's helpful to to show us that in your um, in your application. If you are able to show that you have a broad base of support, so again, that can be people that are contributing volunteer hours, um, that, that community is on board with uh, the work that you're proposing to do with this capital um, work, this capital expense, and that your, that your staff and your board of directors are really committed to this vision and this project is really important as well. The only other piece I'll throw in that is useful to know about these um, capital expenses is that the Neil Noyce Tillotson Fund prefers to come in with middle to last dollars. Um, and so if you have already gone through the, the sort of the first stages or even the bulk of your fundraising and you're looking to top off kind of the final um, the final costs for this um, for for a capital project, that's the time to come to the Neil Noyce Tillotson Fund. Um, and the only caveat I will share with that is that if this is, gets at what Sonia was describing earlier in terms of this housing, the seed fund, um, and that that's a new fund that will be established in the summer of next year that really is housing specific, but that will provide kind of first dollars in uh, to housing related work. Um, I think that is it for that. So, uh, Jean, I think I'm handing it off to you now. Great, thanks, Phoebe. Um, so now the um, the rest of our there was a question. Sorry, sorry, oh, just sorry. A question in the chat. Um, is there a percent of project cost for capital? So we don't have a hard and fast rule for, you know, you have to get to um, the a certain percentage of the cost of the project in order to then come to, to the Neil Nui Tillotson Fund. But that middle to last dollars is really what we're looking for. Um, and so I think it's also a more competitive application if you can show that broad base of support. So just to kind of reiterate, so if you're able to show that, um, a significant portion of the cost is being covered with other sources that will help to build out a more competitive application. So we don't have a like a per exact percentage, but and please, you know, again, call us if you have any questions or want to talk it through.
All right, I think we can move on to the grant program descriptions. Um, so as you know, the Tillotson Fund has four specific grant making programs for 2023. Each one is different in terms of its criteria, the award amounts, timeframes, deadlines, and geographies. So in the next few slides, we'll walk through each one. And feel free to ask questions as we go through the slides, or you can, again, at the end of the session, we'll pause and see if there's any questions left from there. Um, we're also going to send you a list at the end of the session. We'll email you a list of the application questions for each of these programs so you can begin working on your proposal. It will also include some tips for navigating the online system. Um, you can't actually get into the online portal until January 4th, but you can certainly start looking at the questions and thinking about what your answers might be. So um, a few highlights before we get down to the specifics. Um, the Tillotson Fund is moving towards an emphasis on multi-year operating support. In, their, in the past, there was an emphasis on projects, but we've heard from community partners that an award for operating support provides greater flexibility to respond to changes on the ground. So proposals for operating support are welcome. And please check with staff if you have any questions about whether a proposal is a good fit for a project or an operating request. Our preference is that you review each of the grant making programs and decide on the program that best meets your needs. It might be your budget, your timeline, or the purpose of of your request that decides which program is the best fit. The only exception to the one program preference is the DASH grants program. So you can apply for a DASH grants program and a local grant in the same year, or a DASH grant and a large grant, or a DASH grant and Empower COAS Youth grant. And three, um, very similarly, you can apply for a Tillotson grant and a New Hampshire Charitable Foundation grant if you're based in um, the United States, those um, proposed, some of those popular programs, one is the Express Grants and the other is the Community Grants Program. And you can find a list of all the grant making programs on the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation website. It's the same place where you would go if you wanted to find anything about our tilts and fund programs. And of course, as we've said, please call or email me if you have any questions about the grant making programs. And I'll try to answer your questions or refer you to Phoebe, Sonia, or John if I don't have the answers. So next, um, we're going to move into the first program we're going to talk about. Um, and that is the local grants program, which accepts proposals up to $20,000. Most of the, these requests are for one year, but the fund does consider longer time frames, up to two or three years. We strongly recommend that organizations apply for one grant program at a time, which we mentioned before. The local grants program has two deadlines, January 18th and July 19th. We strongly encourage you to hit the submit button a day or two before the deadline to avoid any technical glitches. So these deadlines are at 5 p.m. on the, the dates. So um, we do stick to those deadlines, um, just so you're aware. Um, so at that point, once you've submitted your proposal, the staff, meaning myself, Sonia, or, or Phoebe, will review each proposal. And we do contact the grant writers if there's any information that's missing or needs clarification. Our local grants committee is made up of 11 community members from Coas County and surrounding communities in Vermont and Quebec. They meet twice a year, so they review the submitted proposals and um, Usually that we see, we usually typically receive about 30 to 35 proposals, and we award between 25, 20 to 25 of those proposals. Um, the committee is going to use the community investment framework of the fund to review proposals and make decisions. So some of those important considerations that Phoebe has already mentioned is that we look for strong partnerships, diverse funding streams, and the impact of any particular proposal. So January proposals are notified in March with a decision and the proposals submitted by the July deadline are notified in September. I think another important thing to note, I don't know if this has come up before, but we accept proposals in English or in French. 
And then it's up to us, we make the translation um, if we need it into English. So again, uh, it's important for our French partners to know that they can apply in their first language um, and not have to worry about translating any documents. So that's it for our local grants program. So our large grants program, this is the grant making program that probably has the biggest changes for 2023. The program now has a rolling deadline as Phoebe mentioned. You can apply at any point. And then we hope that the timing can be right for your organization. Final award decisions are made by the Tillotson Fund Advisors at their March and September meetings. Another change for 2023 that we wanna highlight is is that this is an invited application. So we ask that you contact Tillotson staff to have a conversation about your proposal idea. Once we've agreed together that the large grants program aligns with your needs, we will invite you to apply through the online portal. So again, there's no specific deadline for the large grants program. For those of you familiar with the online platform, this means that the large grants program will not appear on your dashboard in the online system. You'll need to call or email me or someone on staff to set up a time to talk about your proposal. You do not wait, need to wait until January 4th to reach out and have this conversation. You can call or email now to begin the process of applying. As in past years, a large grants program seeks requests over 20 up to $300,000. Requests are usually from one to three years. We suggest, suggest that proposal budgets are approximately $100,000 each year, but we can make adjust, adjustments if this doesn't quite fit your project idea. Again, there will be back and forth once you have been, been invited to apply with the Tillotson Fund grant reviewers. So there's no deadline to apply. And again, applicants will be notified of the final decisions in March or September of this year. So I'm gonna just pause there to see if there's any questions. I'm just gonna uh, say that it's a uh, 12.57 by my clock. If anybody has to jump off, feel free. You know, if you have to get to your next thing, we will continue for probably another five, 10 minutes, um, but then there'll be a recording available for this if you, you do end up having to leave. And it looks like we have a question from Melanie. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for these very useful information. I was wondering um, if we have like uh, many activities that are eligible under like one bucket, let's say for us environment stewardship, can we uh, submit a proposal with different type of activities? or you prefer like one specific project? I would say, don't worry too much about trying to fit it into the buckets. Um, I mean, like definitely review them and, and make sure that it's like, yeah, it hits three of these or four of these or just one of these. Just tell your story in the application and it's, it's okay. on us to kind of figure it. Like we want you to make this as, as easy as possible for you and, and so, um, you know, as long as you feel as you review the um, the different types of projects in the investment framework, if it fits in, we'll we we will we'll be able to interpret that. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, the recording. Sorry, there's a note. Uh, the recording is going to be posted on um, our the instructions page for each grant program, and and that'll probably be in a week or two. I don't. Um, we don't. We have to do some internal things first before we can get it posted. But we'll be sharing that shortly. And Jean can also email out a link to the recording once um, once we have it up and ready to go. Great, so now we're gonna move on to our DASH grants program. This is the newest of the grant making programs for the Tillotson Fund. Um, the program was designed in response to conversations with community members who voiced the need for um, a grant program that was small locally based projects with a streamlined application process. So this is, um, as you can see on the screen, it's requests from 250 up to $2,000. These are one-time requests for smaller projects with a one-year timeline. 
This program is available to eligible organizations located or working in Coas County and surrounding communities in Vermont and Maine. For organizations located in Canada, there's a Quadacook program called Express Grants, and you may contact the MRC of Quadacook for more information on how to apply. The online portal for this program also opens on January 4th and stays open through December 15th of 2023. The program has a rolling deadline, so you can apply when the timing's right for your project. And there's only one application question, which is um, describe the project, your intended outcomes, any community partners that you might have involved, and any other information that might be helpful, as long as a and as well as a project budget. The turnaround time is usually three weeks or less. And you can apply to this program more than once, but we encourage you to consider other grant programs if a specific project requires additional funding. So that's it for the DASH grants program. And um, for our next slide, I'm gonna turn things over to John Nicolodi, who's our Empower Coas Youth Program Facilitator. Thank you, Jean. And hi again, everyone. My name is John, and I'm the consultant who facilitates the Empower Cause Youth Grant Making Program, also known as ECY. And ECY is a grant making program, dispersing funds. And at its core, it's also a youth leadership and youth empowerment program. And to talk a little bit about how that works so in our fifth year of the program, I'm going to try to not to talk too fast because I get excited about this part talking about curriculum. Um, but the way that our program works is that in the springtime, we have students from Coas County, Essex County, and Upper Grafton counties apply to be a part of our committee that then starts the following fall in conjunction with the school year. Um, and during that fall and early winter, we're doing a lot of learning. We're learning about nonprofits, how they work, how their budgets work, um, how foundations and how philanthropy works. They're thinking about how they work as individuals and also how they click together as a team, as a committee. Um, they're also making site visits to grantees that have been awarded grants the previous year. We're having guest speakers come in from across the region talking about their nonprofits and their community work. Um, and the teens are also thinking about their communities and their region, uh, their perspectives on them and how they want to use their voice and make an impact. Um, in January, our deadline here for this year is January 18th. Nonprofits apply to the Empower Coast Youth Grants Program for up to $10,000. And then in March, the Empower Coast Youth Grants Committee decides on who to award those grants to from a pool of $50,000. And it's a really incredible thing to watch. Gene and I are in that room in that March meeting, but neither of us really say anything. We just kind of like kick off the meeting, here's the agenda, and we are just flies on the wall watching their perspective and their leadership come forth in this really awesome way. Um, some notes and clarifications to kind of add on to this is that when I say our region for Empower Cost Youth, it's nearly identical uh, to the Tilton Fund region, but slightly different in that it matches the region where our students are from, uh, which is Cost, Essex, Essex, and Upper Grafton County. Um, and then the ECY grants program also has different priorities from other grants program. And the program was initially designed for students. And over the last five years, it's been designed in lockstep with the students that have come through the program. I am the facilitator and I don't really tell the students what to do. They tell me what to do and how to help them design this program, um, whether it's the grant application, the grant report, or last year, the students redrafted their grant making priorities for this upcoming grant cycle. Um, and those priorities can be found on the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation website. Um, to reiterate them here quickly though, they are to support environment, environmental initiatives that involve youth, increase extracurricular activities for youth, strengthen community engagement through events and public gatherings that enhance connection and togetherness, and address gaps in need for underserved low-income residents. Um, I think that that is all that I have to say. Um, if you have any questions about Empower Coast Youth, you can always reach out to any of the team here. Um, Tilton team, any additions or clarifications or any questions out there um, from anyone on Empower Coast Youth before we move onwards? 
I don't know if this is in regards specifically to Empower Coast Youth, but there's a question about um, for for programs with a deadline. They open January 1st, but but when are like when's the last day to submit your application? For like the January and July. Jean, do you know? Oh, do you mean for the local grants or? No, it would guess... be local and ECY, right? When does it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it opens January 4th and the deadline is January 18th. Thanks. And what about for the spring local grants? Um, so it usually opens um, June 1st and the deadline is July 19th. Um, so I think we're ready for questions. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll stop sharing my screen and um, just mention that following this um, Zoom call, we'll be sending out a, a list of, again, the application questions um, and how to find instructions. They appear in both French and English, and um, as well as a copy of the strategic plan in case you might have missed that in the chat. So I kind of open it up to the floor to see if there's anything outstanding, anything we might have missed. Looks like, oh, is there a question? Uh, if this is from Kathleen at the MRC, the Kathleen, Aquatic Group, would, you like to, would you like to speak to that or? Uh, yeah, well, uh, hi, everyone. I'm new, so I'm replacing Sarah. Uh, if you have any question, like I just said, you can just uh, contact me. You can write to Sarah's email. It will be uh, returned to me or just call uh, to Sarah's number and uh, I'll uh, call you back. That's it. And that's for the Aquatic Oak Express Grants Program, I think. Okay, thank you. All right, well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And as we said, reach out to any person on staff if you have additional questions or you'd like to talk about a specific idea that you have um, for the Tillotson Fund.